Over 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece, the philosopher Plato coined a new term that referred to the study of self-governance, or how a system interacts with itself to manifest outcomes. That term was kubernetes, or what we refer to today as cybernetics. The first known example of a cybernetic mechanical system also dates back to ancient Greece. It was a mechanical water clock, capable of automatically self-regulating its water levels, independent of external environmental factors or assistance. At its core, this is what cybernetics are, self-regulating systems that use feedback loops from external environments to determine action. But while the concept of self-regulating systems appeared less than 3,000 years ago, cybernetics is actually much older. In fact, it's been around since the first life forms emerged 3.5 billion years ago. Today, cybernetics is defined as the science of communications and automatic control systems in both machines and living things. However, while robotic and biological systems are both cybernetic systems, they're separate fields of study. Their communication, control systems, and locomotion function differently. At least, they did traditionally. The future of robotics is unfolding quickly. Increasingly, we're seeing the field of robotics and biology intersect. In fact, as we're about to see, the line between what we consider robot or biology is beginning to blur. In the previous robotics video, we saw how Boston Dynamics are building a new generation of robots that are moving away from the traditional and narrowly capable industrial robots towards building a new platform for generalized mobility. It's not surprising to see there are parallels between these new mobility solutions and their biological counterparts. While radically different in terms of their construction and operation, Boston Dynamics' imitation of biological locomotion points towards a much deeper trend in robotics, an increasing overlap between what we think of as robots and what we think of as a living organism, something we'll call the biorobotics revolution. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's look at the first level of this revolution, the oldest and most widespread use of biology in robotics. Biomimicry is the practice of learning and copying solutions to problems that nature has already managed to solve. We've used it to develop modern technologies from aircraft wings inspired by birds to nanosurface innovations such as natural LED lights that mimic the nanostructure of butterfly wings to super hydrophobic coatings like that of the lotus leaf. Building mobile and adaptive autonomy is a challenge, but the natural world has been doing something similar for billions of years. It's no surprise that few fields have embraced biomimicry the way robotics has, and it remains a potent driving force for its continued innovation. For mobile autonomy, like Boston Dynamics Spot, it's easy to identify examples of how robots have been directly inspired by the unique locomotion of animals such as spiders, birds, and fish. Biomimicry in robots goes beyond general appearance and applies to the cybernetic systems they use to operate. For example, applications of point control are modeled on how chickens' heads self-stabilize during motion. And biomimicry isn't restricted to making existing robots better. It enables us to create completely new forms of robots. The emerging field of soft robotics deviates from typical materials of metals and hard plastics and instead utilizes soft materials that bend and adapt to external shapes and constraints. An example of this is the use of robotic grippers inspired by starfish whose grippers can fit to the surface of an object and delicately grip via tiny suction cups. A similar approach to non-chemical gripping utilizes nanoscale structures that adhere by achieving a massive surface area to greatly multiply electrostatic van der Waals forces. This was inspired by the fact that a gecko's foot has thousands of tiny folds and microscopic hairs that help it stick to surfaces. Aside from grip, soft robots have a number of advantages over their traditional counterparts. For example, 
Taking a cue from octopuses, soft robots can deform to contort into tight spaces and are much more robust from both taking and causing damage and don't have delicate joints that are likely to wear out. Another emerging field inspired by biology is growing robotics. A subset of soft robotics, growing robotics imitate Ivy's ability to grow and discover paths. A rolled up tube can be inflated through pressurization, enabling it to grow through tight, partially blocked and complex spaces while remaining soft and resilient to puncture. They're cheap, easy to build, deployable and controllable with many potential applications from running new cables to delivering new sensors to dangerous and remote environments that can assist in search and rescue missions. And we're just scratching the surface of what's possible with soft robotics. Examples of biomimicry and the robots they've inspired are far too long to list, but these tools will continue to transform the future of cybernetics. With level one, we've only focused on imitating motion, but cybernetics is much more than that. The self-governance that Plato spoke of refers to behavior too. What if robots are capable of behaving like biological systems? Sentience and AI are beyond the scope of this video, but lifelike behaviors don't always require a complex computation and can result from much simpler processes. We've seen how Boston Dynamics Spot is capable of sensing and adapting to its environment, but the idea of behavior can extend beyond individual robots. The field of swarm robotics looks at how large groups of robots interact. Swarm robotics demonstrate how the capabilities of a group can far exceed those of the individual. For example, how LEDs attached to drone swarms can create a light show. These swarms use centralized control and real-time communication to continuously relay their state and individually adjust according to the swarm. Robots like Spot can also use this approach to complete an array of tasks. This type of coordination is effective in environments where external interactions are well controlled and communication is easy. In environments where that isn't the case, we may need to look back to biology. Autonomous swarms rely on simple onboard intelligence that creates a much greater degree of emergent intelligence and functioning. This is similar to how individual unintelligent ants follow basic procedures and communicate through pheromones to build vast and complex cities. The hive mind mentality of ants is replicated in swarm automata and allows them to solve problems far beyond the capability of their individual programming. This emergent behavior makes them suited to ordinance tasks in environments that are partially unknown, uncontrollable, and where distance communication is limited. These systems work peer-to-peer -peer in their own locally isolated network, making them able to function collectively even when many of them are destroyed by the environment. For a robot swarm to work, it needs four functions. A primary goal, a procedure for dispersal into the environment, a method of communication, and a memory storage for shared information. This simplicity makes them cheap and simple to produce. So long as there's enough of them, the swarm will still function effectively, even if their individual components are crude and cheap. Autonomous swarms have seen limited industrial use compared to their centrally controlled counterparts, perhaps due to the less predictable behavior of their emergent intelligence, or because current communication structures for centralized control are generally far more developed. The potential of autonomous swarm robotics, however, is considerable and is likely to develop significantly over the coming decade. While swarm robotics are enabling robots to behave more like biological systems, it's still a type of biomimicry. If we want to see the next level of the biorobotics revolution, we need to see how robots are starting to integrate with biology. Swarm robots use quantity and small scales to achieve things larger robots couldn't. But how far can we take this idea? How small can robots get? We can find this answer in the tiny world of nanorobotics. Nanobots are on the scale of nanometers, or one billionth of a meter in length. That's 100,000 times smaller than the smallest dimensions our eyes can detect without a microscope. 
In fact, it's far smaller than what can be seen with an optical microscope, since it's around 500 times shorter than the wavelength of light. While these sizes seem impossibly small for the scale of fabrication, it's worth remembering that the computer chips your device is using to run this video likely has components spaced less than 10 nanometers apart. At this scale, we're looking at robots who are as tiny as the smallest cybernetic systems in the universe. In the last decade, there's been considerable progress in developing nanoscale mechanical components, including wheels, motors, and gears. These devices are quite different from the impressive microscale components we've fabricated. In fact, many of these nanoscale components are actually molecules. At this scale, our conventional understanding of mechanics becomes somewhat fuzzy. Since these components are smaller than light, we can't actually observe how they work. To learn from them, we infer their function from what happens to the molecules around them. While this complicates the development of nanorobotics, we already have a good idea of what's possible through nature, as biology has been constructing nanoscale mechanical components for a very long time. Flagellum is a type of appendage found across bacterial, archaeal and eukaryotic cells. It generates locomotion similar to a propeller through a rotary motor and arm just 20 nanometers thick and built from proteins. Capabilities like the nanoscale mobility of the flagellum has spawned a new field of robotics, not as inspiration or biomimicry, but for directly building electromechanical components. Bio nanotechnologies utilize existing biological components like proteins, lipids, and DNA to manufacture new molecules or inorganic nanoscale components that are used in the assembly of nanorobots. This is biology directly interacting with robotics, and it can work both ways since nanorobots can also be used to build biological components. This may be in its early stages, but it's part of the broader field of biofacturing, where living organisms like bacteria, fungi, and algae build inorganic materials and components used in many industrial applications, including robotics. This varies from macroscopic materials, such as the hard or soft plastics we saw in earlier robots, down to metallic nanoparticles. The interaction between biological and mechanical cybernetics isn't limited to manufacturing. In this next level, we'll see how these systems integrate with each other to become biohybrids, part organic, part inorganic. In 2017, researchers used a laser to locate a buried landmine 20 meters away. But the laser wasn't designed to detect landmines. Instead, the laser was programmed to detect a special type of bacteria engineered to grow fluorescent green in the presence of a nearby explosive compound. This is a biosensor, a new type of cybernetic system that's part mechanical and part biological. They use organic components like enzymes and organelles as part of a sensing and transducing circuit that can be integrated directly into a robotic system. Biohybrids aren't just about integrating biology into robotics, it works both ways. This is perhaps most apparent in the field of bionic prosthesis, where robotics are used to substitute or augment living components, from arms and legs to hearts and lungs even eyes, and the brain itself. In 2015, at a medical facility in Tokyo, a dog with late-stage terminal bone cancer was treated with drugs encapsulated in a basic nanocarrier, and an ultrasonic activator on a robotic arm was used to trigger the release of drugs at the tumor site. This was intended to only be an initial safety test for the procedure, but to the researcher's surprise, the tumor shrunk by 15%, allowing the dog to walk again. Follow-up procedures extended the dog's life by over a year. If this procedure was applied to humans, researchers estimate the increase in life expectancy would be 10 years. With the emergence of nanoscale robotics, these techniques can go further. Nanoscale robots are small enough to flow through blood vessels 
and can be used to deliver drugs in much lower doses to specific target sites, clear dangerous plaques from arteries, and perhaps even perform microsurgeries. While this technology is still in the research phase, with many human trials planned for the next few years, it's looking increasingly likely that robots at the smallest scales may become a part of us. And this is just the medical application of nanobots. Robotics at this scale may be a key step towards enabling atomically precise manufacture, the assembly of large structures atom by atom. The capabilities and impact of such an approach are vast, but perhaps that's a topic for its own video. Biohybrids may be starting to blur the lines between biology and robotics, but what if it could go further? What if robots could become biological? Well, last year, that's exactly what happened with the invention of a new type of robot, the Xenobot. Xenobots are biological programmable robots grown from stem cells of the African clawed frog. Xenobots are partially synthetic life forms because while they're derived from frog cells and retain an unaltered genome, they're entirely unique from any structures found in frogs. They're a life form that's never existed before. Stem cells can turn into other cell types, and in the latest generation of xenobots, stem cells are converted into skin tissue and naturally form cilia externally, allowing them to swim through an environment. Xenobots are built like robots, but use biological components instead of the typical electronic and mechanical components. Evolutionary computer simulations are used to determine stable configurations of cells that can maneuver through an environment. They're capable of healing themselves and can be designed to accomplish predictable behaviors. Like swarm bots, xenobots can work together to accomplish objectives such as sweeping up iron oxide particles in a petri dish. They even have a basic memory function, the ability to permanently react to certain stimuli, like the presence of a particular compound. This can trigger a group response among nearby xenobots, such as communicating signals across the swarm or activating new behavior protocols. The goal of this research is to understand how cells are capable of coordinating to build and repair new structures. Xenobots get instructions from frog DNA at a cellular level, yet they can automatically adapt to their new xenobot life form without additional instructions. It's hard to understate how important this principle is, not only in understanding the mechanisms by which life forms assemble and maintain themselves, but also in the context of future biological robots. The potential of xenobots is significant. Their applications may be similar to ones we've seen from earlier types of robots we've looked at, like biological sensors and biocompatible delivery systems for drugs but they may be capable of much more, such as fighting pollution by finding and consuming ocean microplastics, or perhaps even regrowing patients' body parts from their own stem cells. Xenobots are still in the research phase. There is much to understand about how they work and how they could be applied. Currently, their capabilities are extremely limited and not scalable since each individual xenobot is made by a researcher performing microsurgery. It remains unclear what role xenobots will have in the future of robotics. But what is clear is that it's a new level of the biorobotics revolution, a level where biology and robotics have merged to produce robots that are very much alive. This video is just a glimpse of the astonishing progress and potential of the biorobotics revolution. As we've seen, mechanical cybernetics have come a long way from the automatic water clock of ancient Greece. Its progress has rapidly accelerated with the help of its much older biological counterparts. Robotics no longer just moves like biology. They're starting to behave like it, be built by it, merge with it, and even become it. The implications of a co-evolution between these previously separated branches of cybernetics are dramatic and may impact many areas of our lives. But while branches of robotics and biology merge, there are many non-biological breakthroughs that the field of robotics is leveraging. 
new inorganic materials, sensors, and technologies that are capable of things well beyond anything that's ever been seen in nature. And they're creating new capabilities that could change everything. But that's a topic for another video. If you're interested in learning how to build your own robots, but don't know where to start, then a great way to explore topics like these, and many more, is through this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a community and platform that's built to help you explore your interests, learn valuable insights, improve yourself, or perhaps create something new. It has a huge range of classes on many topics, from creative writing and music production, to marketing and entrepreneurship, and new premium classes are being added all the time. Topics are curated to help you find just what you're looking for, and the classes are designed around learning with no distractions or ads. There's even great classes on topics we saw in this video, such as building and programming your own robots, learning the fundamentals and opportunities of nanotechnology, and creating deep learning nets in Python. I've wanted to get involved in 3D printing for a long time, but I've put it off because I don't have my own printer. However, I came across this excellent class, Introduction to 3D Printing, an easy start to your first 3D design by Lauren Slowick, which takes you through the whole process of creating something new to printing it, whether you have design experience or not. This class showed me just how easy it is to have my own CAD designs printed and shipped to me on services like Shapeways without needing a 3D printer. If you'd like to try this class or one of the many others like it on Skillshare, then click the link below. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today.